let me start. Um, I have all the dates down on the bottom that I've done this, which kind of delights me because lots of people have participated. Um, I'm talking about the first century that this church was in existence and there won't be too many mentions of Unitarians or Universalists, but I still think it's a good story. On the screen, you see all the different names this church had during the 18th century. So it had quite a few different identities. Um, for people who must know the whole big picture, here it is. We'll be just doing 18th century. There were two meeting houses, um, a lot of Presbyterian origins, a lot of Boston history, the American Revolution. The church switches from Presbyterianism to Congregationalism at the end. And then some exciting stuff about the Constitutional Convention. And the rest of it we'll get in a two weeks and four weeks out. Okay, before I talk about colonial Boston, I just have to acknowledge that it didn't start in the 17th century. One beautiful thing about my current church in Ellsworth, Maine, your, your church in Ellsworth, Maine, is we start every single meeting by acknowledging we're on the land of the Wabanaki, and it's changed my thinking. I can't do a presentation about history without starting there. So a lot happened before those Presbyterians arrived. Uh, you're familiar with a lot of things on this list. An important one is the 1630s, that first Puritan church, um, first in Charleston and then on the Boston Peninsula. Those people came for religious freedom, but apparently only their own. <laughs> they weren't too welcoming, although they did allow some Baptists, which people don't always realize. And then down at the bottom, King's Chapel was Anglican and served the governors and soldiers. But it's so exciting that they're a Unitarian Universalist Christian church today. So one thing that's interesting is how much Massachusetts at this time included Maine. And it really is a part of our story because Western Mass in Maine was the frontier. And one of the only ways that strange Scots-Irish Presbyterians could be welcomed was to send him out to the frontier to be a buffer zone with the Native Americans. I'll say more about that. But you can't talk about this period without talking about Maine. New Hampshire had this tiny little carve out and they were part of the story too, of course. Um, to talk about the land, right here you see the original Shamut Peninsula in black. The little blue star to the right shows where the original Long Lane Federal Street Church was. It was pretty near the water. Um, the star a little bit to the left of that shows where Arlington Street is today, which would have been pretty deep in the muck of the Back Bay. There wasn't any landfill there for a long, long time. And to jump to a 19th century view, you see how much land got filled in and you can see the same blue stars. And I love this quote that I put up. Um, you don't think about Channing and fishing, but he said there was sufficient depth of water near the Federal Street Meeting House for smelts to be taken. Channing said he had taken these fish near the corner of Federal and Milk Streets. Uh, it's just kind of hard to imagine today that you could be fishing down in the financial district. Okay, just a little bit more. Our people, our Scots-Irish people were part of a huge exodus in 1718 and 1719. They were Ulster Scots, which meant they were living in Northern Ireland, but they had a lot of Scottish origins. So maps from the 1720s tell us a lot about Boston of the era. I've got several, but I'm gonna go through them quickly and just make a point on each. This is a, a good one, the 1722 Bonner map. My green circles show you all the Boston churches. Um, there were quite a few by 1722. The red circle is where the Church of the Presbyterian Strangers would be erected, but it was only a barn because the Puritans would not allow them to have an official church. And I'll say more about different forms of church government and why that mattered. Uh, moving quickly along, this is a list um, of some of the churches, some of which are still in existence. Old South, um, their current meeting house 
was built the same year as um, Federal Street Church, 1729. King's Chapel in a couple of more incarnations was there. Many of those churches moved to the Back Bay, just like Arlington Street. And this I threw in just for fun. Somebody had too much time on their hands and superimposed a, a current Google Earth map on top of this 1722 Bonner map, which always, it just gives me a pause. Okay, a little bit about these Presbyterians. I mentioned briefly, this the green is Northern Ireland. I guess I should have officially put it in orange because it's the rest of the country that is so often thought of as green Irish Catholics. Um, up here, you have all these Northern Irish colonies and this is where the Ulster Scots immigrated. The important part is that they were Protestants. We know so much more about the 1840s story of all the poor, starving Catholic Irish who came to Boston and weren't particularly welcome. But these people came very much in the 17, 18, 19 period. Um, there, it's a lot longer story what was going on in Northern Ireland, but the British were being fairly abusive, taking lands, restricting lands, um, uh, disallowing people from earning a livelihood. So they were looking for a new home and they were very attached to their Protestant Presbyterian form of worship. Um, so when they came, the original five ships came, they wanted to come to Boston. Uh, Boston wasn't too excited about having them, even though some of the Boston, I think someone had written a letter to shoot governor or commissioner shoot, and he had seemed to be welcoming. But when they got here, they were told, unless they had sponsors or finances, they were not going to be welcome. So the first couple groups came up to Booth Bay, Maine, and they got stuck on their ships for a whole winter. I cannot imagine spending a Maine winter on an 18th century ship in Casco Bay. They were in pretty rough shape. A group that fared a little better with the Londonderry settlers in New Hampshire, they first went to Haverhill, Mass, and then they formed a very important community they called Nutfield, we know as Londonderry. And these two um, early colonies just spread out all over. Uh, New Hampshire and Maine both had a lot of Scots-Irish Presbyterians for a long time. Um, they, and then of course people really, the people who could get into Boston because they had a trade, and I'll say more about that. They, if they had something to offer, they might be allowed and those people did form a church and they worshiped in a barn. So um, what you see here is just some of the other communities that were outgrowths from those early Presbyterian communities. This is interesting. I recently found it. I didn't have it in here before, but it shows you the Presbyterian churches by the time of the revolution, which is a little bit further ahead. The main coast had so many and we have almost none now. New Hampshire still has some. A lot of them have merged with Congregational, UCC. Boston doesn't have very many. A bunch of us visited one in Newton that had some connections with our original church about 20 years ago when Jean and Stan were still alive. This was the first minister. He was born in around 1703. He was very well educated. These Presbyterians liked well educated clergy. And he came, we're not quite sure that when either with the 17, 18, 19 ships or soon thereafter, he was very congenial and he came to Boston and connected with um, the people in Boston who wanted to form a church. He served the church till 1773 after being installed in 1730. And one thing that was interesting about him was how connected he was with his people's lives. If a guardianship was required, his name's on that piece of paper. If a widow was settling in a state and needed a man on the paperwork, so often it was his name. He was deeply enmeshed in a good way with the people in his church. He also went around and visited all the families in Boston every year and catechized, um, quizzed about religious doctrine or dogma 
depending how you look at it, um, the children and the families. On the other hand, he mostly paid attention to what the presbytery, which was the groups of minister that make decisions. He was pretty much attentive to them, but when he didn't like things, he quietly went his own way. So I think we have some roots that even though he was an evangelical loyalist, I think we had a few things in common here. One other thing I have to say, and this is new in this presentation, is he had a slave, um, Scipio Moorhead, who turned out to be a fairly well-known artist in our time in the African-American community. Um, I love this story because it's sometimes hard to find our African-American roots in this period. Um, Phyllis Wheatley was also a resident of Boston. She was a young slave who wrote brilliantly. Her people educated her that owned her. And the, um, Mrs. Moorhead, John Moorhead's wife, had taught Scipio Moorhead, their slave, to draw. Um, I don't believe there is such a thing as kind slavery, but at least it wasn't the most abusive. But they still owned these people, even if they helped them and gave them skills. When Phyllis Wheatley um, got enough interest in her work to um, consider having it published, I think in England, um, people started challenging her and saying that couldn't be written by a young black girl. How could that be? And Moorhead was one of the um, very illustrious group of people around 1770, late in his life, who joined and wrote a foreword to her book saying, we have examined her and she did indeed write this and regularly writes poetry. Scipio Moorhead, Moorhead's slave, um, did the engraving for her book, that very famous engraving of Phyllis Wheatley. So uh, they're an important part of this story too. Um, People asked me the last time I did this about the land transactions, they're all there in the Boston um, land records. And ironically, the first time the land is on record, it was sold for 100 pounds. Um, then it was divided in half and sold for 50 pounds. Um, when John Little bought the land, he bought it for 550 pounds. So I think there was a little inflation in Boston around that time. He built a barn on the lot, after which point there was a bunch of controversy with the other people who were worshiping in the barn in the Church of the Presbyterian Strangers. They had to have an advocate of some kind to help sort it all out. But finally, he sold it to the meeting house, the lot with the barn, for $140, but retaining his pew. Pew ownership is how churches were funded. I don't think they ever passed a plate. They funded the churches through the most prominent pews with the best views, had the biggest rents. And people passed these deeds down through their families. And they're very important part of our records, knowing who was in the church, because they didn't publish directories with pictures like some of our churches do today. So this is conjectural on my part. They weren't allowed to organize as a church. The Puritans weren't having any religious freedom outside their own cohort. But they built a barn and so many people came to this meeting house, especially the Scots-Irish, that they added windows and they added wings. I think this is my best guess at what it might have looked like. It might not have even been that tall, but that's my thought about what the first meeting house um, from 1729 or 30 up through 1744. And one of the reasons I put all those pictures up and emphasize Maine is that the Presbyterians from the Maine coast, from New Hampshire, New Hampshire had its own churches in Londonderry, but Vermont out in Western Mass, Coleraine and Warren, they all came to be baptized and married. And, you know, sometimes even funerals, they flocked to Boston, which now that we live up here, Going to Boston is a big deal. It's what a four or five hour trip with our fast cars. They found a way by ship or overland to get to be a part of their church community. Pretty awesome. Just a little bit more. Here's a 1728 map. Um, that is um, number C up on the right. That's Old South. And Long Lane, between Long and Lane is about the place where the church was built. 1728 map. Um, I'm going to show a couple more maps here just to give you some context. Going back to the 1722 map, I highlighted Long Lane in yellow, and you can also see a little cross street. I keep pointing at the screen, forgetting you can't see me. And um, 
then if you come over the central part where it says King Street, now State Street, they've built out this enormous wharf, um, which is now all filled in. There's no mile long wharf, but at the time it was really long. And you can see how much Boston is becoming a commercial center, which really doesn't peak till the 19th century. Shipping was huge and shipping up and down the coast was huge. And, you know, of course, the church is now where that giant bank is. Oh, and here was, a, I found this recently. Here is a church, a view from the water of all the steeples. And again, the Long Wharf. Okay, so I'm going to jump ahead just to give you a little more context. Um, this is the 1814 map, Hales map. And you all know, if you walk around downtown, Franklin Place, Franklin Street today is still kind of wide. Here's Long Lane, um, the yellow one, uh, now called Federal Street. And this was the third church building, which we don't get to in this century, but you can see how it's oriented. The side of the church was on Long Lane, just like the side of our current church is on um, Boylston Street. So it faced this little cross street called Berry Street. And all of you who go to GA ministers, you know the Berry Street Lectures. That's because they started in the vestry, but that's part of our 19th century story. Okay, and people always want to know what happened later. This is the area where the church was. I love this picture because it's the first aerial photograph ever taken in America from a balloon. But here's that wide part on Franklin Street, and here's what went in after that church was taken down. And what's important, they moved to Boston, uh, they moved to Back Bay in 1859. They would have lost the whole thing in the fire of 1872. So we're very glad they did. We have a few artifacts from the original church. This was the 1809 building. And I'll say much more about that in two weeks. And that of course is what you see today. And there is a plaque. I understand it's a different plaque now. If someone ever gets a picture of that, I'd love to have you send it to me for this. Okay, jumping way back in time, um, many of you who've been around um, up through 20, 2001 um, will remember seeing, holding the Presbyterian communion silver. For many years, it was used in the communion service, very, very important in Presbyterianism. Um, they had like a four day communion service, maybe once every month or six weeks, and people would come from all over to have this intensive long service. And so what happened was um, we accumulated this beautiful, beautiful silver. It was sold at Christie's in 2001. Um, here's an example of our congregational polity. I was dead set against selling it. I felt like if it had been in the family that long, we could find a way safely to keep it at one of the museums, but the bank couldn't keep it for us in a vault anymore. So the Prue and other church people decided that we needed it to be sold. There's a much longer story there. It was sold for much less than we expected to get because the museum directors started to panic that all these Boston churches were selling silver. They got together the night before the sale and said, let's not bid. We sold it for a very low amount, but it did seem to stop church silver sales. So that's a much longer story, I won't elaborate. But what's wonderful is the beautiful, beautiful inscriptions. Um, we know who this person is, the gift of Mrs. Elizabeth Nichols. Her husband was a tailor, David Nichols. We know quite a bit about them when they came to Boston. Um, I have records on a lot of the parishioners that wouldn't begin to fit into an hour. Um, if I get time, I'll tell you a little bit more. This is a Jacob Hurd cup, a very early one. He's a very well-known silversmith. And you'll notice that Presbyterian is spelled with an I. I. I see that quite a bit in this period. But a lot of these people, they came, they prospered. The Nichols family moved a couple of times. He did well as a tailor. And so even early, they were able to give this gift of one cup to the church. I think it's it was listed to sell for something like 50 or 70,000. Here's another gorgeous one, early work of Jacob Hurd. It has his mark on it, um, 1731. These are early in the church's life. This, we know a lot about this family, Bryce and Ann Blair. Um, 
they were very early. They came from Martha's Vineyard after coming across the water, and they were admitted to the church in 1722 with four children. And as this was so typical, they were required to present sureties to indemnify the town from them being on the dole, essentially. But they quickly acquired a house and land, so that moved up, acquired another house and land. And here's an example of Moorhead's involvement. He married two of the Blair children. He served as a trustee for um, the wife's real estate transaction after her husband died. He was executor of her estate. And she ha they had pew number one, which had to be pretty special. She gave her pew back to the meeting house. And in her inventory, in her will, it was her most valued possession. So. And this is another one a little bit later from 1753. Um, it's a Paul Revere. I think this sold for the most. It was listed to sell for like 200000 Again, we didn't get what we thought we would realize. Okay, jumping ahead a little bit in time, people were coming, people were joining this church. I think a lot of the people who worked with their hands, I call them the salt of the earth people, tailors, coopers, um, mariners, uh, sailmakers, they were very drawn to this hardworking group of people. They weren't really worshiping with the gentry. Um, the Boston Brahmins have roots in this church, but that's not how the congregation felt at this period. So by 1744, they put up a real meeting house. Um, I'll show you more about the interior when we talk about the Constitutional Convention. But if you think of Old South, the old Old South, not the one in Back Bay, um, it has this same organization where there's a window for light in the center of the sidewall and the pulpit is there on that long side wall. So just like the old Old South that's nearby, um, we had that same alignment. And one of the other churches, one of the congregational churches, perhaps in Hanover Street, which would be North End, after they constructed a steeple, which was a really big deal, they gave a bell for it. So this church had a bell. This is one of my favorite parts of the story. This pew layout from about, I think it's the 1760s, is one of the best documents we have. And I'm grabbing a spreadsheet here because I can't read what I'm going to show you. Um, you'll see there are groups of pews on either side of the pulpit. And again, the pulpit's on the long wall. There's pews in the center. Um, and then you can see where the staircases are. And then the doors are on the shorter sides of the building. So let me, whoops, what did I do here? I was just gonna um, show you a few of the names. Um, there's that Nichols name again. The people I'm showing you here are tanners and tailors, painters, glazers, and rope makers. Here were the people down on the outside wall. They're pump makers, distillers, leather drapers, merchants, and rope makers. Um, not to get too hung up here, bakers, shoemakers, coopers, mariners, carpenters, and ship joiners. That's a kind of carpenter. Oh, and we get a tobacconist. Um, merchant, tobacconist, mariner, caulker, chair maker. Um, and I'll just finish out here. Oops, I went too far. Let's see. There. Um, blacksmith, well digger. Uh, lots of tobacconists. We know smoking was popular, but these are some of our best records. And one of the things I wanted to do before I left Boston was to compile a book of who these people were. I could probably still do it um, with the internet. I'm just fascinated with them. I've researched a lot of them and their families. And I think it's such an important story, you know, how these salt of the earth people got along with the very opinionated Puritans. Okay, I need to speed up or I'm not gonna make it. Again, I just wanted to um, mention one other example. I talked about these close interconnections and marriages. One of the early families um, that was married in the church were the brothers, Matthew and Hector or actor Patton. If my cousin Wayne from Maine is on, I think he'll recognize those names. Um, we're both on the Surrey Historical Society board. So I live on Patton Stream. 
Um, Patton Stream on the north goes into Lower Patton Pond, which goes into Upper Patton Pond. And if you take it down to the ocean two miles away, you get into Patton Bay, an area of Penobscot Bay. Um, these people often started in Boston, these Scots-Irish, and the Pattons went to Saco, and then they spread out all over. And um, the, I'm also related to them. They came up to Surrey, which is the town we live in now. So these wonderful connections make me feel very connected to all of you. Uh, Moorhead died in 1773. Some people have said, in a way, it's good that's when he passed because he was still an ardent loyalist and it would have been tough. Uh, so let's talk about the revolution. Uh, this is one of my favorite ones. The British used Old South for a riding school for the officers after burning all the pews for firewood. Um, Boston ran out of trees pretty fast when the British occupied it for that year. So what did they use Long Lane Church for? People who've seen this before know they used it to store the hay for their horses. So it had, uh, I, I, I would love to see all of you laughing right now, but that's, maybe I'll switch. I've got two displays. Maybe I'll switch so I can see you. Really helps me when I know people aren't falling asleep while I talk. <laughs> okay. So a great many loyalists evacuated. I'm not going to give you the story. You, Bostonians, you know these stories. Evacuation Day, St. Patrick's Day, although it was Evacuation Day then. Uh, leading members of this church took the church records first to Nova Scotia and Glasgow, and they have mostly not been discovered. There are still some in existence, and I well know where they are and what they are. We also have the vital records, the marriages and baptisms and such. Henry Knox, his family was a member of this um, church. And of course he was significant in uh, moving the British out of Boston. He's the one who went to Fort Ticonderoga, brought, dragged those cannon back through all those mountains in Western Mass and Vermont and set them up in, uh, over there in Dorchester. And the British woke up one morning and realized they were surrounded by cannon up high and they left fairly peacefully. It took about 10 days to gather the folks. And after that point, the revolution continued south of New England uh, until 1781. During the revolution, most of the men were absent. They ha had to follow the fighting. The church was rarely used or occasionally someone was brought in to preach, but I think it was closed. After the war, considering how many Presbyterian loyalists left, we had patriots who had very strong feelings about self-government. We had some moderate Presbyterians who were open to change, and we still had some angry Presbyterians who didn't leave, and they still wanted the traditional Calvinist forms of worship. This sounds like, as Phyllis Richter used to say, a church fight brewing. So after the revolution, um, the traditionalists called Reverend Robert Annan from New York State. He was a traditionalist. One of my favorite stories is he started lining out the Psalms where he'd holler out a line and the church would chant it back. And other people had found some beautiful um, hymn settings by Isaac Watts, which we still love. And they would sing them instead of letting him line out the Psalms. So we had this total cacophony characterizing this church fight and they hassled him. Um, the church was divided over hymns, theology, authority, polity, that's the form of government. The Presbyterians um, accept uh, decisions from a presbytery, a gathering of ministers, a regional gathering. Um, they were in, more interested in the Puritan congregational form where each church makes its own decisions like Arlington Street um, and pays their own minister, can hire and fire. Annan missed a lot of services. He was often out in New Jersey and Pennsylvania where all the rest of the big Presbyterians were. He finally left in disgust. People didn't wanna pay pew rent anymore, which is the only income there was. But what's interesting about him, he had a notable career elsewhere and is known for finding a dinosaur skeleton in his yard in New York state. So finally he leaves and the people who want congregational polity. They want to decide their own fate as a church. They want to call and possibly let go of ministers. They want to raise the minister's salary. They don't want to answer to anyone. I think the revolution is really infused them with self-determination. So I love Jeremy Belknap. 
Um, he is known in so many different ways. He was in Dover, New Hampshire, where he felt kind of stuck preaching as a Congregationalist. He had some liberal leanings, but he had to kind of keep them to himself. He was also considered evangelical. But finally, he'd been trying to get to Boston because he was a historian. He was a big thinker. He founded Mass Historical Society. When I worked there um, in various capacities, I was lucky enough to have one of his original portraits in my office for several years. And he had an early, because he dies in 90, 1798, he early understood that the records, that the records people have, the records of the war, the records of the soldiers were really important. Not what rich people said about history, but the actual records made. And he would drive around New Hampshire with his horse and ask people, do you have any old records? And they'd say, yeah, we've been burning them in the stove to start the fire. And he'd cajole them into giving them to him. And he founded the Mass Historical Society because of his amazing ability to get history, original history. So he's often known more for that. But he finally got to Boston when this church was ready to adopt the congregational form in 1787. Um, and he died quite young in 1798. So he was only here for 11 years, but he did some pretty amazing things. Here was one of his preaching um, books. This is the last year of his life. You can see where he is. He's at Federal Street. He's also in Charleston. They often had two services. He, you can see he's at Federal Street. These are wonderful records. They're at Mass Historical. But you can see he kept fabulous records of his services. And he kept public health records of what was happening to people in the community that are still critical today. He made maps. Um, he was just an amazing contributor to our larger culture and well-being. He was lucky enough to be part of a very important event that took place at the church in 1788. The, they originally, um, I think they went to the Brattle Street Church, which it is no longer in its original site downtown. That church was not as big as the federal, as the Long Lane Meeting House, which hold, held, I think, close to a thousand. And so many people, this is every small community in Maine and Massachusetts had to come to this ratification meeting for Massachusetts, because of course, Maine's not separate till 1820. And it was enormous group of people and they were there for a month in a church that really didn't have a stove officially till after 1800. Can't imagine January and February in a cold church, but they did it. And if you've been into the um, uh, state house and if you can get into the House of Representatives, there's a fascinating set of murals um, by um, a herder. His son was a governor of Massachusetts, Christian Herder. This series is called uh, Milestones on the Road to Freedom in Massachusetts. And the one I've got the red arrow pointing to is his conception of Federal Street Church in that meeting house. To the left, I think it's Old South. And to the right um, of ours, there's drafting the Constitution. You can look up the Herder murals and learn all about them. Here's a color picture. Um, and of course, there's the sacred cod, which is a good story. And there's the one to the right. And you can see that he modeled it quite a bit on Old South because that 1744 meeting house had that window over the pulpit and had galleries. And you can see the pews coming right up around the pulpit. So that one is called um, John Hancock Proposing the Addition of the Bill of Rights to the Federal Constitution. Pretty exciting milestone. And there's there you can see it and you can see the church building. Um, Belknap got to be there every day and he was sitting up front with Hancock and both Adams. It must have been amazing for someone who loved history that much. And you can see the galleries, which I, I think was a tradition that went all the way through to Arlington Street. Um, these are some interesting uh, newspaper cartoons because they needed to have a sixth pillar to be able to um, ratify at the federal level. So I think Massachusetts was that sixth pillar, which 
um, basically brought the federal constitution into being. At that point, the church became Federal Street Church. This was really a huge deal. It's still, this fact is still on the Arlington Street um, plaques outside, which I love. And I love the cartoons of the day. And there was a song, somebody in our previous in-person meeting with a great voice, one of the men sang this for us, but just a couple of verses, the Vention did in Boston meet. Oh, the State House, the old State House downtown. State House could not hold them. So then they went to Federal Street and there the truth was told them. And, uh, you know, Hancock ma made a woundy federal speech. I think they meant windy. And they adopted the Constitution. And this is a little outside my scope, but the, the um, rich folks on the coast were very much um, fighting with the people from Western Mass, the everyday landowners, farmers, because they had very different interests. So at that point, and you can read about it, you can read the whole day-by-day um, -day proceedings online of this constitution, of this convention, but the people from Maine and Western Mass are often fighting with the rich merchants and ship owners. It's kind of interesting. Um, this is our final minister of this century. He's an interesting guy. Um, if you read any of the American Renaissance, you know, 1840s, people like Longfellow and his cohort who went to Harvard, all these guys in their diaries laugh about old Professor Popkin. He served as a minister with us. It really wasn't his thing. It was too urban for him. It was too big. There were too many demands on him. He was single. He never married. And he finally, after going to Newbury to serve a less demanding church, um, he finally ended up at Harvard living at the school and being a mentor and a little bit eccentric to to decades of important uh, young men who are part of the American Renaissance. So he's an interesting guy, but he, he leaves of his own volition. And so just to bring us a little bit further along, um, they didn't know what to do when he left. They were looking for somebody. Channing had just finished his bachelor's and I think a year of his essential masters, his license to preach. He was very young. He considered himself very untried and he'd get to get offers from larger Boston churches, but he felt like this at that time, small, um, not too demanding church, he had a different view of it compared to the big Boston churches would be much more his cup of tea. And so he came to Federal Street and he served till 1842, which is our story for next time. Please visit ASCBoston.org for more information about this historic Unitarian Universalist congregation. Arlington Street Church, gathered in love and service for justice and peace.